Good evening, everybody. This is my place of peace. This is uh, Desolation Sound, um, cruising with my family. And um, this is one of my favorite views of the, the neat mountaintops there. So that's my place of peace. But uh, I also have that picture up because the water and sailing are such a big part of me, <coughs> my life. But I'd be nice to many, I know, um, so is dyslexia. So to lighten the mood, have you heard the joke <laughs> about the insomniac, agnostic, dyslexic? <laughs> If you have, don't say the question. <laughs> Poor guy. He stayed up all night worrying if there really was a dog. <laughs> dog God. <laughs> Did you also know that words that end in one more than one syllable, when you hear ick, it's I C, not I C K. So if you are a dyslexic who's had specialized education that helps your brain learn to read, write, and spell. That's one of those many helpful um, language tips because you have to teach dyslexics through the brain. It's not just memorizing words. So that's something I picked up in teacher training later, but I'll come to that. So my story, um, I, my mother, who's here in the audience, doesn't remember any speech delays. I learned to read with everybody else. I did well. Um, everything was normal um, by appearance. My first struggles that I remember are, uh, we're in third grade. Um, this other girl and I were kind of the top two students and I started to notice I couldn't finish my reading assignments as fast as she could. Okay, yes, I'm a perfectionist and I'm com very competitive, so that plays into it. Um, yeah, and I kind of skipped over um, my competitive sailing and all of that, but if you want to learn more about R2AK, I can point you in the right direction. Um, we're giving, my team and I are doing some talks. So um, this may be a surprise if you came to hear about R2AK, but I'm going to be sharing my something that's a lot um, closer to my heart, and that's my growing up dyslexic and for many years not knowing it. So I had trouble reading, uh, getting my reading assignments done. I could decode any word on the page. I memorized my times tables like that. I uh, won the fifth grade spelling bee, um, went on to regionals. I, I was identified as gifted. I did well, I got good grades. I had nice handwriting. I never flipped letters. Um, all those stereotypical things you think of and that my teachers probably thought of as dyslexic. Uh, then in middle school and in high school, the books get bigger, more complicated. Um, the bigger ones, I started to have trouble finishing um, papers. I became the master of the five paragraph format. I won competitions with that five paragraph essay because it was a formula I could just follow, plug and chug. And, uh, but then in high school, the books got even longer. I went to a, a college prep school, a girls' boarding school. Um, the Grapes of Wrath nearly killed me. <laughs> uh, I was a big fan of Cliff Notes, but I knew I was really missing out on the whole point of the book and the author's style and all those things I wish I could have the time to read, but probably it would have taken me most of the school year to read one of the 10 books I was supposed to read. Papers became a problem. Um, fortunately, most of them were short. Uh, my U.S. history term paper, we had computer labs then, we had electric typewriters, and this was late 80s, and uh, I was five minutes late turning in my U.S. history term paper that I had struggled and worked so hard on, and I got six hours of punishment um, in our uh, works, uh, it's called um, study hall um, work hours. So for my five minutes late, I was scrubbing desks and doing all sorts of things to, um, to make up for my five minutes late. But I worked really hard, and my parents were told by my sophomore advisor that I was the hardest working sophomore. And uh, I can remember 
because I had roommates, this was a boarding school, I can remember setting my alarm and going into the bathroom to finish my work, staying up late by, by, with my little, little light by my pillow and my bunk bed so I could stay up late finishing my reading. Um, <laughs> actually, one time I fell asleep and um, this was a school with still four nuns in charge. The teachers were nuns, but <laughs> sweet Sister Christine, she was really the only nice one, she was patrolling outside and happened to notice through the window that I was asleep with my reading light on my pillow. And it was actually starting to burn a hole in my pillow. <laughs> so I think that was the last time I tried reading in bed when I was uh, staying up later than my roommates and I would just go to the bathroom. But um, I um, took AP classes and did, got A's in the classes, but then when it was time for the test, I could only finish about half the test. So as you can imagine, that severely impacted my scores. I only finished half my SATs and ACTs. So I got no college credit for all those um, harder classes that I took. Um, I managed to get into Stanford. And uh, not only that, but I qualified for the Science and Engineering Math Achievement Program, which put me at a higher level than my future husband. I had a lot of shared classes with him freshman year, engineering level, calculus and physics, but I had um, calculus um, 6x. He had um, the five unit calculus, so I had extra um, classroom sessions, extra work. <laughs> and um, calculus AP had been the class in high school that unfortunately I should have stayed in should have gotten help to stay in, but I had dropped. I was senior class president. I was applying to multiple scholarships to help pay for school, and I was getting the first C of my life. And little did I know, that's, that's pretty normal. It's okay to get Cs, but at the time, I thought it was all over, and I dropped it, and I went down to regular calculus, and they never caught up to where I was in November when I dropped my AP class. So I went to Stanford, sort of unprepared for that harder level calculus, and um, and it really seemed like the problem sets were biased. They were all about engines and pistons, and I never grew up working on engines like my future husband did, boyfriend at the time. So he was constantly drawing pictures and showing me how pistons worked. And <laughs> uh, So I, I was getting C's in, uh, at Stanford, too, in calculus and physics. I had a campus job as part of my scholarship. I was on the sailing team. That might have helped me get in as well. I was recruited. I was a competitive sailor growing up, and so I felt an obligation. I sailed all through Stanford, and uh, but I had to drop the campus job. Um, Stanford had this policy that you could drop a class up to 24 hours before the final. They don't have that policy anymore, <laughs> and I can understand why. Um, so I would take all that. I would do all most. I would do all that work, and then I would panic at the end and drop the class. I'm sorry, Mom. <laughs> Some wasted money there. But uh, so then I would try to make up for it the next quarter and the next quarter. And uh, I ended up with um, advisors who um, didn't recognize how hard I was working and not understanding why. I was beginning to question my intelligence. I didn't think I belonged there. Um, there was a whole disability resource center at Stanford that I could have taken advantage of. Reader services, untimed testing, note takers, you name it. I could have had the help if I'd known it, that I needed it. I just had this belief that it was a fluke I was there. I wasn't smart enough. My, um, the girl who crewed for me freshman year, she was an English major. So we could come home from sailing practice and she could go after dinner and whip out her paper due the next day in a couple hours. And I kept thinking, I can do that, I can do that. I just need to really concentrate and, and, um, and I can do it. And, and I never could, it would take me days. And so I got pretty used to asking for extensions. I hand delivered papers to professors' houses sometimes because that was the only way I could get it to them at the last, last, last deadline that they would give me. Um, Sounds terrible, but I was in survival mode. And, uh, and then, um, oh, and my, my freshman, in, speaking of advisors, my freshman advisor in engineering, older engineering professor, when he saw my C's in physics and calculus, he said, well, you gave it your best shot, try a different major. 
<clears throat> and later, later I found out many students got C's in those Harvard classes. So I played spin the major. I did human biology the next year, which was supposed to be half sociology, half biology, with all the pre-meds. <laughs> and big, huge books, three-hour midterms. So I struggled with time where I just had to pick a major, something I loved. And I always loved art. My mom had always taken to me to art museums, no matter where we were in the world. Um, turns out I'm very visual. That was one of my strategies, coping strategies, to compensate. I can still picture the picture, my um, fifth grade spelling bee pages. I just memorized the look of everything that helped me become a good speller. So my strong visual ability was what got me through. Turns out my whole family is very visual on my mom's side. Artists and architects and um, my sister's super mechanical. So I did art history, but and I love the detail and the analysis, but what do you have to do in art history to show what you learned? It's almost always a paper. So uh, I had three papers, big research papers in my major. I never got done. They're still not done. So that's a big admission. Most people who know me don't know. I never graduated from Stanford. I took more than enough classes, but I am 12 units short of that graduation. And you might say, oh, just go back and finish. <laughs> but those papers became monsters within a year, and they're even bigger now. I'm not going back, and that's not who I am anymore. I've moved on. Um, and I did have one glorious last quarter at Stanford. I qualified for women's nationals um, for the sailing team, like we usually did. We were ranked top 10 every year. But I told my coach and my crew, who was one of my best friends, I can't go. I've got 20 units. Stanford's on the quarter system, so it gets out later. Um, so we would go to nationals, and these other schools, they'd be having a good old time at Stanford athletes would be studying because they knew they'd have to take finals as soon as they came back if they weren't already doing them on the plane and things like that. So um, I said, I can't go. And I wrote an essay that was more a creative essay based on the lectures. And um, I did so well that the professor who had turned me down um, for a recommendation the previous year to go to Greece on a classics dig that I really wanted to go on two years before that because um, I had done not so, that's such a great job on trying to finish an essay too quickly and um, this time she put gold stars all over my paper <laughs> and she recommended me for a classics award. I got a, a big monetary award. She published it in her syllabus the next year um, and this outstanding professor um, was beloved by everybody on campus um, because she would come in with articles she'd read related to kids in her class. She had us fill out a note card at the beginning. I took two classes from her. She taught um, Greek, classical, and Hellenistic art. She would have everybody fill out a note card to talk about you and your interests and why you were there. And so then, on her own, I don't know how she had time because as a teacher I know to be a good teacher, it's more than full time. She would come in with articles and interesting things and hand them to students as she walked in based on what she knew about them. And for her big projects, of course we had papers, but she required you to do something related to Greek art. So my first class, I took Greek dancing lessons and I taught my class. The second one, I decided I'd try sculpture and I bought some soapstone and I sculpted my hand that's in my garden now. <laughs> and. Um, so of course we had reading and papers, but it just, it was a lot more of an active way of learning and um, really got you into the culture and it was more than just book learning and lecture, which unfortunately I think still dominates a lot of education. And it's hard for those visual learners, like my older son, um, who's single digits listening comprehension when he's in a class where it's all lecture based and hardly any examples but I, can't, I couldn't get a diagnosis for him, so he didn't get any accommodations in high school. Um, so I, um, a week before Stanford graduation, I um, had heard from my roommate who was in charge of reading services um, that two of our good friends had been diagnosed dyslexic, and she said, you know, you could get tested 
So I went to the Disability Resource Center and I filled out a checklist of, of, of things that I was struggling with and I had checks on two thirds of the hmm. questions. So they paid for me to be tested in Palo Alto, which was great. And um, I was diagnosed um, just phonetic dyslexic, having trouble with auditory processing and sequencing, and it affects my comprehension. So sometimes, um, if it's something that's unfamiliar, or I'm nervous, um, I mean, a lot of lecture material in college, it's new material, you're not that familiar with it, and. Um, so I'm trying to take notes, which helps me learn. It's visual, it's kinesthetic, but it's a lot of auditory to process. So I know I missed some of what I was hearing in lecture. And um, conversation, sometimes the words will come in my head in a jumble, and I feel like I have to straighten it out and then comprehend it. Sometimes my words will come out of my mouth in a, in a jumble. They're just in the wrong order. The sounds are in the wrong order. And um, I think we've already done it a couple of times tonight. <laughs> so, um, after that diagnosis, um, I uh, became interested in a school near Stanford where three of my cousins had gone, all severe dyslexics. They were caught early, lucky for them, and they went to this special school. I remember my cousin Erin, she didn't know how to read at all. She didn't know any of her letters in second grade except for the letter V, because when they watched sports games, they would say V for victory. So because she physically formed this letter, that was the only letter she knew. So they went to this school that taught multi-sensory structured phonics and language and everything that you needed to know. And they um, used a method that, um, that was created starting back in the 30s research that started in 1930s, the so Orton Gillingham base, which is really the foundation of all the structured phonics methods now, whether it's Wired for Reading, Wilson Reading, Slingerland, um, that I'm all familiar, that I'm familiar with now. So um, I spent half a summer working at the Denver Art Museum, thinking maybe art education. Through my sailing instruction in the summer, um, I discovered my interest in teaching. I'd also had a summer internship at NASA. I originally wanted to be an engineer, I mean a mechanical engineer, then aerospace, and be a mission specialist at NASA. So, but I was really bored that summer, working on 20-year-old payload labs and um, cleaning rat cages and <laughs> things like that. So I um, really enjoyed my sailing teaching job the next summer. And um, so I spent half that summer after graduation at the Denver Art Museum and half at this school near Stanford. And they hired me to come for the next year. And I, my eyes were open to a new kind of education where um, kids who otherwise couldn't learn, right? Kids, although you don't, intelligence has nothing to do with dyslexia, but it's easy to, easier to spot when you see this discrepancy, right? Kids who aren't learning. Um, and I saw these kids learning for the first time and how exciting that was. And I was the substitute whenever they needed a substitute, and I was a classroom assistant in K through eight, and I loved it. And I got trained in a couple of their methods, and I started to tutor. Um, my husband and I got married. We dated during freshman year. We, he got his master's at Stanford while I supported us with my little teaching salary. And then we moved to Michigan. And there were no schools like this school near us. So I went back to school. And for um, two years, I had the benefit of accommodations. Getting my, I remajored in a teachable major. Uh, I minored in elementary education. I got my teaching certificate. And I felt like there were some classes and professors there who were better than at Stanford. This was Grand Valley State University in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And so I want um, those of you who are in high school and thinking about applying to colleges to know there are great schools out there you've never heard of. And there are great professors out there who are at these schools you may never have heard of. Um, so I learned so much. And yes, I was inspired. I, I had a I found my career, I felt like, and I got trained in more methods to help dyslexics. I can screen kids from kindergarten through college now. I can't diagnose, but I can say, yeah, you've got these characteristics, you might want to get more testing. These strategies will really help, um, and that's been really rewarding. So I taught fourth grade and um, loved it, uh, but it was general education. And uh, then we moved to Seattle, and um, I, um, 
Well, actually, we were in Germany, and I taught in a British school <laughs> as, uh, as a volunteer. Then we moved to Seattle. Um, my husband's from Bainbridge, so he's trying to get us west. And um, I did some more tutoring, and uh, I worked at another school for dyslexics in Seattle. And then my son's school needed a reading specialist, and logistically it was so much easier than going um, across town to be at the same school as my kids, and I loved it. I taught first grade for five years, and I was the school's learning support teacher for seven. And I absolutely loved it. I love the small group work. Um, then we moved here, and sailing coordinator for Parks and Rec, and pretty soon I got really involved at Port Madison Yacht Club, where I'm now the Commodore. And, um, and then you heard my most recent adventure was on the R2IK race to Alaska. So sailing's still a big part of our lives and we cruise with our kids and I help coach the high school team. Um, but I still volunteer um, twice a week at Sakai in the Read Naturally program. It's not fully using my background, but it's, it's great to work one-on-one -on -one with the kids and I can sneak in some strategies. So um, I feel like my experience with dyslexia has made me really sensitive to kids who struggle academically um, and empathetic. Um, I feel like um, there's a, still a big lack of knowledge about dyslexia. Um, a bill was passed in the state of Washington that officially recognizes dyslexia now, just in the last couple of years. And so they know now that um, early identification is critical and, and prevention is easier than remediation. The percentage that of um, the chance that you can become a fluent reader and writer goes down huge each year. So by the time an eight, you get to an eighth grader who hasn't had any help, um, there is like nine percent that they'll become a fluent reader or writer. So it's really early. It's really important to catch them early, but you have to be careful. It's more than just flipping letters um, or being a bad speller or having messy handwriting. It's anything to do with a difficulty with language when you can rule out other things like intelligence and eyesight and hearing problems. So if you see a kid who's working really hard um, and they've had exposure and there are no biological explanations that are obvious, um, dyslexia is 10 to 20 percent of the population. So um, there's a good chance there's several of you in here who have it and you may not even know it. Um, mine is very slight, but obviously it caught me as I got into more difficult, challenging um, assignments academically. And it still affects me every day um, with auditory. I have to look at people when they're talking. I know now that if I'm in a learning situation, I need to be right up near the front. Um, I can't handle auditory distractions because my auditory processing, I need to be able to um, focus when I've got to write. And I end up writing a lot. <laughs> I have a Yacht Club newsletter, um, Commodore article that was due today. That they're going to get late. <laughs> um, but uh, just look for those kids that, so they don't slip through the cracks because um, all kids want to succeed. They're not lazy. They're, they're not misbehaving because it's more fun. They're avoiding the task because it's hard. And I learned as a teacher that boring is a code word for difficult. So um, I think see if I covered everything. <laughs> I think I might, oh, some famous people you might not have known. Um, there are gifts of dyslexia. So my visual memory, my visual thinking, that's my one of my gifts. And now the empathy that it's created in me. Um, but they know actually that the dyslexic brain is wired completely different from the non-dyslexic. The right hemisphere is symmetrical. The two sides are the same versus the non-dyslexic, typically the left side is bigger. And the right side, that's the side that you get those creative thoughts. So they say dyslexics, um, none of us are born with the ability to read and write. It's a common combination of genetics and, and, ex and environment. But the dyslexic brain just thinks differently. There are different connections and there are methods that can um, use those connections. Um, for instance, big writing in the air. So when I was a teacher, um, I learned to write quite easily, I think, compared to my non-dyslexic trainees. So um, if I said, welcome to Chip Talks, and I am writing in cursive, welcome to Chip. And now you're seeing it so that it's mirror writing, and it's forward to you, but it's backward to me. 
That's super easy for me, and I did it first time when we did our teacher training. Um, and I think that's my dyslexic brain. Even though I never flipped letters, I think that ability exists. And I, my mom said my grandmother used to write letters to her children at camp backwards, and they'd have to hold it up to a mirror. So did Leonardo da Vinci. So some other famous um, dyslexics are Thomas Edison, Einstein, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Steven Spielberg, Charles Schwab, just to name a few. So those dyslexics can think in, in different ways than non-dyslexics, and that's their gift. They, they are innovative thinkers. And uh, so I hope that um, you've enjoyed my talk, and I'd be welcome to talk if you have any questions, answer questions. Thank you for listening.